Hi folks! Well in this session I'm going to carry out a review on my recently acquired Ascar 300 FRA Pro Quintuplet Astrograph. I'm Dr Ray and welcome to Astrogadge. this session I'm going to see how well it performs on a broadband target and compare it to results obtained using the EDPH 260mm refractor. I know it's not a strictly scientific comparison, different telescopes, different optical designs etc etc but I really want to see how well um, the chromatic aberration is controlled by comparison. Essentially, it's a, a box within a box. <laughs> uh, it's pretty well packed. It's got the usual stuff, inspection certificate, and user manual, which looks a bit thin, but look at that later. There's also a screw for the bottom focuser. Um, packaging, and oh, yeah. there we have it. Okay. So far, ah, these are like uh, adapters, camera adapters. Here is the Ascar FRA Pro 300. I have it uh, piggybacked onto uh, the Esprit 120. Um, it's the 300 refers to the focal length as a 60 millimeter objective diameter that is. It's f5. Um, I think that's the reason NASCAR call it Pro is because it's, it's the shortest focal ratio that they produce. FRA stands for flat refractive astrograph. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with the term, um, an astrograph is simply a telescope that's designed purely for astrophotography. It's not designed for visual astronomy at all. The design makes it very difficult, if not impossible, to, to use with eyepieces. It's got five element um, lens design. Again, I'll come, come back to that in a minute. One of the elements is actually um, extra dispersive. However, Ascar don't actually say what, where, what glass they've used here. However, I've got reason to believe that it is FPL 53, and I'll come back to that later. The telescope utilizes what's called a Hatesville design. Now, short focal length refractors suffer very badly from chromatic aberration and field curvature. And the Hatesville design, as it's called, actually corrects that. Well, both these, both these aberrations internally. So there's no need at all to use a, a fuel flattener on this instrument. It's all internal. So the pixel design should provide a high degree of correction for both chromatic aberration and field curvature. As you can see, I've got the telescope uh, attached to the ZWO ASI 2600MC Pro Micro Color Camera along with the off-axis guider and guide camera and I also have a filter drawer attached. Now I have I have used the M48 uh, adapter here to connect the, the camera configuration. Now as I said this this telescope has a Patesfield lens design which means as I say it's 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 already flat field um, corrected. Now this particular camera, um, filter drawer and um, off-access guider provides a back focus of 55mm that I use on my uh, 
that they use on the spree, for example, uh, because the spree has a, a fuel flatter on it, and the critical back focus distance is 55, of which this is uh, pretty much dead on. Now, because I've got an M40 adapter here, because of the Patesville design of the telescope, it means that I've got, unless I exceed a distance of, it means that unless I exceed a back focus distance of 71 millimeters, then this is fine, it'll automatically be corrected. So the beauty of this is, I can just unscrew this and screw it on to the Esprit or any other telescope with uh, a back focus of 55. Um, and I don't have to worry about changing the, the back focus distance. It's automatically corrected. It comes with M42, M48 and M54 adapters. And the maximum back focus uh, differs slightly for each of these adapters, but it's pretty much uh, in the same sort of um, range. The upshot is, provided you can actually get an image and focus in the camera, then the field will be flat, flat corrected. There should be very little, if any, field curvature. The image circle, um, produced by the scope, is 44 millimeters. So that's plenty big enough to support a full frame sensor. The other thing about the scope that's nice is it has a rack and pinion focuser. Uh, so it's about the 1 in 10 reduction as usual. And um, what's a nice touch is it has um, screw holes uh, placed that allow fitting of electronic assisted focusers. And in this case, I'm using the ZWEF, and it was absolute, you know, it was absolute trade walk to, to fit it. Screws just fit perfectly. Spacing's good. It just took me a couple of minutes to fit it, which is absolutely wonderful. Sorry ab ab about the sound. That's <laughs> my neighbours actually. I have a a resident uh, colony, or I forget what the term is, uh, of rooks. Um, something's spooking them uh, today, I don't know what, but they're being particularly noisy. Anyway, back to the scope. The other, the other thing that's nice is we have a field rotator here uh, with a locking nut. I should have also said, of course, that the, the focus comes with a locking nut, but since I've got the EEF on it, it doesn't really matter to that. Uh, as I say, the, the field rotator, or camera rotator, has a locking nut here, so it makes it, easy to, it makes it easier to compose your images and to, to lock into that position. The only thing I would have liked uh, would have been some sort of graduation uh, around here, so you could take a note um, of where exactly the, the, the camera was. Uh, particularly useful if you're imaging over several nights, but that, that, that's a minor issue. Comes with a fixed style mounting plate and a, clam, a clamshell uh, clasp on the mount. Also has this rather nice handle come accessory uh, mounting plate and also comes with a finder shoe. So plenty of uh, ways to fit any accessories that you, that you may need. Oh, and of course, <laughs> we need to mention the dew shield. Look, guess. It comes with a locking screw, but guess what? It, it doesn't flop or, or fold down on its own. The ADPH2 used to do. It's a very portable scope. I mean, this, this, this could easily be a travel scope. It's a little on the heavy side, it's just over three kilograms, and, and that's principally because it's a, a quintuplet. Uh, lens system which obviously increases the weight um, and it's just over I think 300 it's 301 or 2 millimeters in length when the dew, dew shield is retracted so again it, as, as I said it's, it's 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 very compact and of course once the camera's off it you know, it, uh, it would easily go in a carry case although I have to say it isn't supplied with a carry case but uh, there are plenty of cases out there um, fairly inexpensive cases you could, you could buy that this will fit into nicely. I should say the reason I've mounted it on top of the Esprit is purely for convenience. Uh, well, two things really. One is uh, I didn't want to muck about with putting counterweights on it because uh, basically I'm using I'm using a, a Skywatcher EQ8R mount which <laughs> 
it's complete overkill for a telescope that weighs three three kilograms. So I'd have to put some sort of counterweight system on it, rather like I did for the AGPH2. And going for the path of least resistance, I thought the simplest thing to do was to actually just mount it, piggyback onto the scope. Uh, and also, secondly, um, I want to use this uh, the bigger scope uh, for, for a couple of objects as soon as I get a, an opportunity uh, after trying this out. And uh, I couldn't be bothered taking it off and putting this on. And again, as I said, I'm the quick counter it. So uh, just uh, laziness, I guess. But I call it convenience, but never mind. So the only thing to do now is to uh, wait for a clear night, I guess. Okay, so here we've got the Ascar piggybacked onto the Esprit 120. Um, it's not a great night tonight. Um, it's a full moon and there's a little bit of a haze, but it should be good enough to 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 you know check out the performance of the scope. Um, it doesn't need to be a fantastic image, but we should find out exactly how good it is compared to the EDPH2. Anyway, um, let's let's see, let's see how we get on. There's a lot of high cloud rolling in, and uh, because of the half moon, it's it's conditions have pretty much deteriorated. You can just about make out uh, Jupiter uh, about 10 o'clock to the moon. Um, so I think it's I think it's time to uh, call it a day really the conditions just start getting worse. Although I had to cut the session short I think, uh, I think I've got enough to make some sort of um, informed comparison between the scope and the EDPH2. So uh, let's go and see what happens after I process the image. We start we have 23 120 second sub exposures taken uh, using the Ascar 300. They've all been calibrated, uh, in um, integrated, and processed in Pix Insight. As you can see, doesn't seem to be any significant bloating or chromatic aberration. Uh, None at this level anyway, I think once you actually start zooming in in the, you know, if you start pixel peeping then I think there's a tiny little bit evident, but generally well controlled. And here's the blue channel uh, and in the EDPH2, um, this was, the stars were very, very bloated and you can see here using the ASCAR they are not, they're well controlled, they're pretty much pinpoint. There's the same object uh, image using the EDPH2 and as you can see all of the stars uh, show significant chromatic aberration, lots of horrible halos, um, lots of bloating, um, even some of the red stars uh, are showing a, a definite blue tinge to them. Um, just generally I felt unacceptable really uh, and um, you can see the difference obviously with uh, the Ascar and, and again as we, we said in the last session in, in the blue channel it's particularly evident that that's where most of the chromatic aberration uh, resides and you, know, you can see the significant bloating here to see the difference between the two I've put them side by side uh, again it's it's not a perfect comparison by any stretch of the imagination different focal lengths etc uh, but you can definitely see the the difference in the blue channel as far as the chromatic aberration is concerned to hear that uh, the camera I use in combination with both these scopes uh, results in uh, a degree of uh, undersampling um, which isn't a problem for wide field photography so much Impressions uh, on the 300 are that it performs very well on broadband target. The chromatic aberration and field coverture are very well controlled. However, 
for those of you that are really into pixel peeping, in other words, you know, zooming in insanely on, you know, stars, you will notice a tiny bit of chromatic aberration is present. It is, however, minimal and, as far as I'm concerned, perfectly acceptable. Um, all short focal length refractors suffer from chromatic aberration and it's really just a question of how well controlled it is. In this instance I think it's well controlled and it's really not noticeable unless you're pixel peeping. A uh, huge difference uh, from the aberration that was evident in the EDPH2. Before in the previous postings I have a little bit of tilt in my imaging uh, setup, a tiny little bit. It's there again, if you pixel peep you'll, you can notice it. But it's, it's quite minimal and in my opinion I'd probably spend hours fiddling about trying to get absolutely perfect and probably end up making it worse. It really is not that noticeable unless you pixel peep. I really do like the Petzl design. Um, as I said, for me, being able to take uh, the imaging train of the Esprit 120 and put it onto this telescope without having to worry about readjusting back focus is a big plus. It's just essentially plug and play and I really like that. Telescope's well made, it's a bit heavier than you'd expect purely and simply because it's of the lens design. It can certainly be used as a travel scope, it's small and compact enough. So far, on a broadband target at least, it performs exceptionally well, bearing in mind that a similar, similar spec refracting astrographs can cost up to three to four times more. I think it performs very well at that particular price point. I still have to try it out on a narrowband emission object and that's going to be the subject of my next post. Uh, so far so good for this session. Thanks so much for watching. The next session I'm going to put the, the scope through its paces with a, a narrowband target uh, and uh, as soon as I've done that I'll, I'll get back to you on how well it performs under these circumstances. So thanks again for watching. Uh, if you haven't already subscribed, please consider subscribing. It doesn't cost anything, it just means that you get a heads up any future content that I may produce. So, thanks again. See you next time. And remember, keep watching the skies. Skies. Everywhere. Keep looking. Keep watching the skies.